We have Ken Gee with us with KRE Partners, and you can learn and find more information regarding what they do at KRIPartners.com. And I'll make sure to have that link in the show notes. But uh, Ken, I really appreciate your time here tonight. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So you're putting together your next fund. It sounds like it's going to be a big one. And uh, if you're not familiar with funds are, I'm going to really send everybody to your website to get educated on that. But what we're going to be talking about is what a fund is, how to get involved, and but more importantly, making sure that you know those people that you're getting involved in, because this is definitely a partnership that you want to maybe consider, but you want to vet out on both ends, both mm-hmm. sides of things in the end. So really appreciate your time here today, Ken. Sure. Thrill- again, thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to it. We were chatting beforehand and we're going to cover the three things a real estate investor investment firm must have before you give them any of your money. So could we start there and probably will guide the conversation for the majority of this show? Yeah, sure. So it's actually a topic that I'm really passionate about because the fact prior to the Jobs Act of 2012, we really couldn't have this conversation, right? The rules were different then. We couldn't do what we do now. We couldn't raise this money privately. And so I'm thrilled to be part of this industry, I guess you could call it. And I think the best way to protect it is to make sure that people do a really good job betting investment for before they invest with them. So it is something I'm talking about almost every single day. So the first thing I want people to focus on is making sure that whatever firm you're investing with, their goals are aligned with yours. That's super important. I think that's important because. If you're trying to get a quick hit, you're looking for something that's going to turn over in two months and going to make a ton of money for you. See, that's not, that's typically not the type of investment that we do. Our investment periods are usually three to five years. As we go through the investor meeting that you and I would have, we would have a conversation about how are we aligned? Is your goal consistent with what our investment is designed to deliver? And that's really important to me because I don't want to set us up for failure later. It's a hard it's, it's, and this is a relationship. It really is. That's how we view it. It's a two-way relationship. And in order for a relationship to work, both parties have to get what they want. And it's my goal that after you invest with us once and you do really well, we hope that you'll come back. So you want to make sure that your terms are aligned or your goals are aligned with the sponsors. Now, the other thing as part of that is you want to make sure that the terms are investor friendly. Now I say that. Because in, in my opinion, this is just my humble opinion. If I'm going to ask you to invest your money with us, and we're going to run the deal. I think that I should put you first in all the decisions that I make. So we set up our fund so that you're going to get your preferred return plus all your money back. And only then do we get a share of that profit bonus at the end. And I think that's super important. So we're talking about goal alignment and we're talking about making sure that the investors are put first. So that's the first thing that I want you to think about. The second thing is I want you to look at the sponsor's track record. Obviously, the longer, the better. You don't don't like to see people learning on someone else's dime, right? That's just not fair. That's not cool. I don't think people should do it. In our situation, we've done 18 deals over the last 25 years, and our entire track record is there to see. We hired a company called Verivest to verify. If you haven't heard of Verivest, they verify your track record. So we send them settlement statements and bank tax returns and all kinds of information so that they can determine that, yes, my track record is in fact what I say it is. So that's important to me that you, the, whoever you invest with has a track, the longer, the better. And then hopefully they're doing similar deal types to what they're asking you to invest in. So in other words, if all of my deals that I've ever done are in self storage. And now I'm coming to you because I want to do a student housing deal. Wait a minute. I don't have any student housing experience and you really want that to happen. So hopefully it's of the same type. All we've ever done are value add multifamily deals. So as you look at our track record, you'll see them over and over again. So I think that's important, a long and good track record. And that kind of leads me to the third thing. And that is experience. So people don't think of apartment buildings as a business because, but that's what they are. They have sales, they have employees, they have insurance, they have every single thing that any other business on the planet has. What you want to do, always people always say, of course you want to invest with somebody that has experience, but the reason why is so important 
If you just look back, we just had a pandemic, right? We're now in the middle of inflation. You want to make sure that senior management team, the team that you're putting your money with has enough experience to try to figure out how to navigate whatever is going to come next. Because we don't know what's coming next. We, we think we do, but I never saw the pandemic coming. I don't know about you. So you want to know that senior management team has experience so that they have some things to draw. For example, we've gone way back to the late nineties. So we've gone through a lot of real estate cycles, 2000, 2007, 2008, that recessionary period, that, that financial crisis that we had. So we draw on all of those experiences every single day when we do what we do. With your experience, I have to ask, with your experience, and since you brought it up, are you seeing some familiarities with that, the downturn last time to where we're at here today? Actually, no. I, the 2007, 2008 downturn, when I can recall sitting in my office having conversations with many people. And it, to me, it seemed obvious that this thing was going to implode. Um, it, you had people that were getting adjustable rate mortgages that they really didn't understand. They really didn't understand that they were buying in at a teaser rate that were going to max out every single time that they increased. And that was going to push the payment out of their reach. I, I, you could just see that coming in the apartment world. We do a lot in Florida. Everything we do right now is in Florida in the Southeast. They were selling apartment buildings that were 50 years old, nothing special, plain vanilla apartment buildings, and they were selling them as condo conversions. So when you looked at the property existing as an apartment building, there was no way that apartment building was going to be able to pay the debt, but they were completely speculating on flipping that thing to a condo conversion. And then to make it worse, back then you had speculators buying 10 or 20 of these units who were going to then just trade it up really quick and make a quick profit. Problem is at some point the credit market froze on them and they had nowhere to go with all of these deals. So now what's really keeping us in check is the credit markets. The lenders will not do ridiculous things like they did back in 07, 08, 09. So I can pay whatever I want for an apartment building, but the lender is going to only lend based on the fundamentals. And that's, what's important, right? Because then you don't have this massive, a bunch of for, a bunch of foreclosures or defaults on the mortgages because the lenders held the line, they were disciplined and they currently are. So that's, I don't see any, I don't see this, what happening back, what happened back in 07, 08. I don't see that happening now. Sure. But in the end, it does definitely feel like the market has been changing. We could really definitely see the, what it happens in, at least in my market, the single family homes are being snapped up so blasted fast. You couldn't even hardly make an offer on things. Now property is sitting on the market a lot longer and prices are actually starting to drop. I'm starting to see pretty regular drops in prices. Now, one of the things that I like about the business that when we're in multifamily, so I know, I think you do a lot of single family. So the pricing mechanism is a little different in our world. I love what we do because I know that if I can increase the cash flow of that chances are someone's going to want to pay more for it, right? Because they're going to have more cash flow. So there is a very deliberate relationship between cash flow and pricing. So when we do our value add business plan, right? So we find a property that's in a good area and it's got good economic growth potential. And what we know that when we make it nicer, when we run it better, we'll be able to get more rental income because we've made the property nicer than it was. We've added value. And we know that when that cash flow increases, that means that we're going to be able to sell it for more than what we paid for it. So I love that predictability about how we do what we do. Sure. With all that being said, you're talking about buying existing properties, right? You don't build anything new. We don't. And there's a good reason for that, especially in the growth markets. Let's look at Florida. There's about a thousand people moving to the state of Florida every day. Some of those people are wealthy, but most of them aren't. They're just normal people, right? And so what are they building? They can only afford to build the super high end stuff that serves the wealthy group of people that are moving there, but there's, they're not building housing for just ordinary people because they can't afford to, the construction costs are too high. So what happens is that we have this huge demand that continues to increase and no new supply. So what happens to rents? It puts upward pressure on rents. And then when we come along and say, all right, we're in a, I call it a bull market, right? Because there's more people looking for housing than is available. Then I put my value add business plan on it and the returns just explode when we do that. But that's how and why we do what we do in, in states like Florida because of the growth. 
So how are you sourcing in these uh, properties? Are they on loop.net or are you building these relationships with the brokers? Like, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm... yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, typically not loop.net. Usually by the time a property makes it to loop.net, either it's there because a private owner is selling his or her own property mm -hmm. or it's gone through the broker world and they're struggling to find a buyer. Usually that's what happens. So we generally work the broker network very in a really intense way. So you said we do funds, right? Most people that buy real estate and raise money to do this, they're syndicators. So they go out, find the deal. Then they got a short amount of time to go raise the money. That's hard. That's hard to do in a competitive environment because the sellers all know that you still have to raise the money and everybody that you're competing with is in that same boat. So I, a few years, excuse me, a few years ago, we flipped that model. We said, Hey, let's go raise the money first, get the commitments. Now we go to the broker community, Mr. Broker, Mr. Seller, we've already got the money raised. We are different than all those other people that's competing for this property. You don't have to worry about us not closing. You don't have to worry about us not raising the equity. You don't have to worry about us retrading you because we've got far more experience. So as a result, we become much stronger buyers in those markets. So we sometimes we'll see deals even before they hit the market or we're not afraid to buy a property that's been well marketed by the brokers. But so when you're in a market for a long period of time, you really develop a deep broker network and they get to know you and they know that if they give us a deal, they know it's going to close. They just know it's going to close and brokers and sellers love that level of certainty. Are there different requirements on your end running a fund versus a syndication then as I'm sure there's some government agencies involved. Yeah, just, it's not really not a lot different. The SEC exemptions available to us are very similar to the ones you're, we rely on either a 506B or a 506C. We do C. So if you don't recall, the 506C is for accredited investors and that allows us to, it's called open solicitation. We're allowed to talk to anybody we want, people that we don't even know about investing in our fund. The SEC just requires that everybody that gets in our fund be accredited. And we have to verify that they are. Those set of rules apply in both situations. It's really no, no different at all. With that being said, I just want to remind everybody, kripartners.com. And then Ken has an opportunity for everybody too. If you go slash ebook, there's a download there for you. I'm sure there's a quick form that they need to fill out too, right? There is. Yeah. So I, the book's going to cover two things. I've had so many conversations with people that they know there's so much money in real estate. They just know there is. They're trying to figure out how it fits in their life. Should they buy a single, buy a double? Should they buy an apartment complex with a couple buddies? Should they invest passively? So I help take them through that process in the first part of the book. Now, the reality of it is most people should passively invest in real estate because they're busy. They got families, they got all kinds of competing priorities for their lives and they don't have time to do this. So they choose to passively invest. So that's typically what most people do. So then the second half of the book, remember I said, I was very passionate about this whole vetting real estate firms. That's exactly what the second half of the book covers. I go into how does this business really work? What makes sponsors and real and fund managers and syndicators, what makes them do what they do? You know, I, I want to educate the investor so that they're asking all the right questions and putting themselves in the best place possible to, to make sure they have a good match with whatever investment firm they go in. So yeah, you're right. It's kripartners.com slash ebook, but that's what I covered. I, I wrote it because I think it applies to so many people trying to figure this business out. Yeah. One of the things that I think is interesting, and you mentioned trying to make real estate investing truly passive when you're doing it to the daily day to day, and you are starting out single family homes and yourself managing rental properties and the like it, the furthest thing it is, it actually being passive. Yes, it is not passive when you're doing that. No, sir. But you're right. People do think of that as passive income and it's really, it's not, it's just not. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question later about busting real estate investing myths. But one of the ones that I always makes me chuckle is that the concept of mailbox money, it just shows up. It's just so easy. Yeah. <laughs> if you invest with a real estate firm like ours, then it truly is mailbox money. Because yeah. after you make the decision to invest, you really don't do anything except read the emails that we send you from time to time telling you about the pro property and what's going on. So, yeah. One of the things you mentioned that you work strictly with accredited investors. I wanted to arm everybody with the concepts of what kind of paperwork or what kind of information would they need to have it lined up and ready for you if they'd want to be involved with a company such as yours. Sure. You So three things that most 
likely you'll get from a real estate investment firm. The first is a private placement memorandum, and that's going to talk about their business plan, what they're doing, the property or the fund. It will also have a whole section for the lawyers to go crazy and talk about all the risk factors, because we want you to understand the risks that you're taking on by investing in a private placement. The second document you're going to get is called an operating agreement. So that when you actually become, if you invest in our fund, you're actually a partner in our fund. You, so you're signing on the operating agreement page that this is document is what governs our relationship. It tells you about how distributions are made and who's in charge and all that kind of stuff. And then the third thing you're going to get is a subscription agreement. Now that's the document that you generally need to tell us your name, your address, your date of birth, your tax ID number, you know, where you want your money set, all that kind of stuff. But then the other part you have to do is you have to tell us how or why you're accredited. And it's either I can, the test that most people fall under, it's either an income test or a net worth test. So if it's income, either you make $200,000 a year for the last couple of years and they expect the same for this year, or if you're married, it could be $300,000 with you and your spouse. So that would make you accredited. And you'd have to, eventually you have to verify that with us. Sometimes we use third parties. You could send me tax returns. You could send me a letter from your CPA, or your attorney that says, I know this guy, he is, I've seen his tax returns. I know he's accredited. And I just have to have that piece of paper in my file. So that when we get audited by the SEC, they can see that we did, we were supposed to do to verify that. The second test is a net worth test. Sometimes a little harder to prove, but if you have to have a million dollar net worth, not including your home. So for those of you who don't really understand net worth, all you do is you take all of your assets and value them, write them all down, tally them up and figure out what they're worth. Then you take out, take your liabilities. How much debt do you have? And the difference between your assets and your liabilities is what your net worth is. And that has to be a million dollars and you just can't include your home in that. So if you meet one of those income or net worth definition, uh, tests, then you're accredited and you're able to invest in the fund. No, thanks for that clarification. I think that that just helps quite a bit for those that might be interested. Going back to the property and sourcing the property, are there certain types of property that you look for and what type of value are you adding to improve the equity there? Sure. So types of properties, they're generally in the business, we call it BC class assets. Basically the best way to think of what we buy, it's decent properties in good neighborhoods. That's the bottom line. I have to be very comfortable taking bringing my wife and daughter and son and walking around the neighborhood. I, that's very important to me. Now, what type of value do we bring? So we're going to do, usually what we start out with is the exterior improvement. So we'll go and I act like I'm dry. I'm act like I'm a prospective renter. And I start with my first experience when I drive to that property, the signage, the front, they call it curb appeal, but it, that's really what it is. And I follow myself as I go to the leasing office. How do I feel? What do I see? Then I go to the amenity package and I want to build the best amenity package I can because people love amenity packages. If I can give you a, a clubhouse with a pool table, fitness center, outdoor grill, outdoor TV, lovely, nice wicker furniture to hang out. And uh, excuse me, if you think about all that, you can really paint a good picture as to what a prospective renter would feel like living at your property. So you want them to feel that they can see themselves in this really nice amenity package. Mom's working out, dad's watching the football game, the kids are in the pool, then it's time for lunch. There's a grill right there. He cooks, he or she cooks and cooks lunch. The parents flipped and one goes to the fitness center, the other one goes in the pool, whatever. You can see a whole family day there. And I think that's really cool. Then we follow the path that person would take to their apartment. And we wanna make sure that it's nice. And then we go inside the apartment and just make sure that it's upgraded and modern. Typically we'll do vinyl plank flooring, the faux wood flooring. We'll do either black or stainless steel appliances, two inch blinds. We'll do a nice paint package, updated fixtures and things like that. So basically we're just basically giving that property sort of a facelift, right? Modernizing it. We tend to stick seventies and I prefer eighties and nineties and newer, but we'll go to the 70, 1970s as well. Typically there's a good opportunity as long as the floor plan isn't become obsolete. There's usually a pretty good opportunity there to make that property feel and look and feel a lot newer than it really is. So those are the opportunities that we look for. And then when we do that, we're typically able to raise, we had to get paid for spending all that money because it's not cheap to do all this. So we're looking probably at 300 plus in terms of rent increases over, over time. 
to mm -hmm. pay us back for all of that. So that's the, the criteria that we use. One of the things that you mentioned before we hit record that unlike syndication with a fund, you might be owning multiple properties within that fund. So what size of properties are you looking for and how many properties or how many units in total are you planning for this current raise? Sure. Yeah. It depends on the property. So property size, we like somebody somewhere between 75 and 250 units. I know that's a very wide swing, but here's what's important. When you get really big, you start to compete with institutional buyers who have a completely different capital stack than we do. And it's just very hard to compete with them because their return requirements are very different. When you go really small, it's very hard for us to put on site manager because we want to have a manager in the leasing office. We want to have a full-time maintenance person. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to do that below 75 units. So that kind of, that's why we stick in that range. And we expect this next fund to be somewhere 15 to 20 million is, is we like that. It's a comfortable fund size for us. We can usually get three deals in the fund and that gives the, our investors good diversification. For example, the last fund, we have a deal in Tallahassee, we have a deal in Daytona, and we have a deal in Bradenton, which is just south of Tampa, north of Sarasota. So you can see those are very different markets. And so our investors are going to enjoy some great diversification. The other benefit, they get a couple of others, but if you think about, remember I talk about that private placement memorandum and the operating agreement and all this stuff, well, the lawyers charge a lot of money to put those together, as you can well imagine. So in our world, I get to spread those costs over three deals. Cause I only have to do one set of documents. When you make a commitment to the fund, I don't have to do three sets of documents. So I save a ton of money and that well, those savings accrue right to the investors. Yeah. This is really interesting how you got it all set up. And then when you take over a property, are they typically formerly mom and pop places or is this like sometimes? Yeah. Sometimes yeah, it's, it's sometimes it, it depends. Sometimes they're private owners. Sometimes they're larger, almost institutional. The company has grown up and they no longer want to mess around with a hundred units because everything else in their portfolio is three or 400 units. And so we're happy to take those size properties because we usually love that scenario because a company that's growing and looking ahead rather than behind, they stop paying attention to those hundred, 150 unit properties. I know that sounds silly because those are quite large properties. But to them, size is always a relative thing. To them, it's small and that's why they sell it. So we love to have that situation because we usually have great opportunities to make that property better. Yeah, thanks for that because I was trying to make sense of the, I run into mom and pop type outfits all the time and then they don't raise rents equivalent to the market and then they don't typically want to spend the money into doing those updates and stuff. And so I was trying to put, put, wrap my brain around if you're buying it from fund or another company, what happens there to make their, the ad, value add available to you? Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of reasons. So first of all, I, we don't dislike buying from mom and pops at all. Excuse me for all the reasons that you described. There are other reasons that we, that somebody else might not, m might sell. So say somebody did a syndication and they came up with a value add plan and they, once you do a syndication, you're done raising the capital right? You spent your budget, you're done. You can't do anything else to the property because you don't have the money to do that. And to call your partners and ask them to contribute more, that never goes well, right? It just doesn't happen. So a lot of syndicators will implement their business plan. And once they're done, they're done. That doesn't mean they've taken it as far as it could go. That just means that they're done and they've made some money for their investors. So there are so many different reasons that properties have upside potential. Right now, the biggest challenge for people is just understanding what they should be charging for rent. So that is a big challenge right now. It just is. And a lot of people are way behind, especially the mom and pops that you described because they, they make friends with the residents and I don't blame them. These are great people that probably live there and it's really hard for them to bring themselves to raise rents. One more time, kripartners.com slash ebook and take advantage of that offer by, from Ken. But Ken, this was a great conversation. I'm hoping you have a few more minutes and I'm going to throw you some rapid fire questions at you. Sounds good. I do. So what is one real estate myth you'd like to bust here tonight? Well, I think we talked about the passive nature. That's one. It is not passive unless you, re unless you invest with somebody else. The second, I I'm going to go with two, if you don't mind. The second myth I'd like to bust is that real estate is easy. So many people don't really understand that it's a business no different than any other. And you really got to dive into the nitty gritty and get into the details because that's what makes you successful. 
So those two myths would be the ones I'd like to bring. What book would you recommend or what are you reading right now? Yeah, I get that question a lot. So I'm constantly reading. I love Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I love Grant Cardone's 10X Rule. I think that's the name of it, something like that. Yeah. So those are two good books that I, I read a lot. I read them over and over actually, because they're so impactful. Sure. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Ooh, that's a good one. The best, the best piece of business advice I ever received was, and this is a nuancey saying, but you got to figure out how to get out of your own way. And by that, I'll say this another way. And I might've stolen this from somebody. If I did, I just don't remember who it was. So not trying to steal their thunder, but I always say that people are where they are because they choose to be there, right? So their brain puts them in a certain spot, in a certain place, at a certain level of success, a certain whatever. And because of that, that's where they stay. And so the best business advice I ever got was the person who convinced me, Ken, you got to get out of your own way. You've got to start thinking differently because you can be far more than you are. The only reason you aren't there is because you haven't chosen to go do that yet. There you go. Yeah. No, that's awesome. What is the biggest real estate investing mistake you've ever made and what did you learn from it? Yeah, believe it or not, there, I've probably I've been doing this a long time, so I'm sure I've made a lot of mistakes, but probably one of the biggest ones that sticks out, and it's kind of counterintuitive. When people buy properties with a value-add business plan, right? You have this in your mind, oh my God, I'm going to make this place amazing. And so they buy it and day one, they're going full speed and they try to do their renovation in a couple months, right? Spend all their money. I did that once. And then what I realized was, wait a minute. I learned some things about the property 30, 45 days after I bought it that I didn't know before, but I, now I was, I had to go into my own pocket to fix that because I didn't, I wasn't careful. So the lesson I learned was when you buy a property, sit on your hands for 30, 45 days, I, it's going to drive you crazy to do it. But if you do it, it is actually the smartest thing that you can do because you'll always readjust your budget and you'll be in a good position to make reallocations of your budget dollars, your CapEx dollars, if you learn something about that property you didn't know before. So that would probably be it. Now, it wasn't catastrophic for me because I could, I just used my own money to fix, to, to pay for whatever it was. But if it's a big enough mistake, it could really be a challenge for some. No, oh, no, that's great advice. So if you could go back into time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, I already told you, get out of your own way, Ken. Get out of your own way. It really is. As I grow older now, I'm in my upper fifties and I feel if I would have done that a lot earlier, I'd be in a very different. Ken, this was a great conversation. Before I let you go, is there a question or concept you wished we would have covered here tonight? No, I love the fact that we talked about vetting real estate firms. I feel really strongly about that because this thing that we do, this private money is giving people access investments that our investors have had 15, 20, 30% annual returns. And without this ability to do what we do, they wouldn't have access to those kind of deals. We talked about that is so important to me. So now there's probably not, I could go on and on for hours and talk about things, but I think that is probably the most important thing. And we did a good job of covering it. No, I appreciate the value you brought here tonight. Again, it is kripartners.com slash ebook. Take advantage of that. But I can. I hope you'll come back again sometime. I have a feeling we could dive deeper on a number of other topics. We could. I would like that very much. Thanks.